All right, well, we'll to have everybody take a seat. We'll get started this evening. I can introduce myself. I'm Steve Cover, Director of Community Planning, Housing, and Development for Burlington County. We've got a really interesting program for you tonight. Um, and so I'd like to, I, we have a couple of our uh, members from our Planning Commission, Ben Nancy Yacomi and Eric Pichon, who can raise your hands. Uh, and Jane is here. Oh, Jane, okay, okay, I can see Jane here. Any other? Any other? Okay, so um, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started, and our first speaker will be uh, Nancy. So Nancy, come on up. Thank you. You know, gosh, I guess we can tell it's the holidays. I, I, I guess I'm such a planning nerd that I thought this is a no-brainer and that we would have standing room only. So I'm, I'm really glad all of you could come this evening, because I see lots of different faces, which I think it's a great thing. Uh, I just wanted to give a word or two about how this gathering came to be. Uh, it's really sort of, uh, was originally thought of for our site plan review committee members, and then we thought, you know, we need to open it up more to the civic associations, because at our SPRC table, we not only have planning commission and representatives from other commissions, as well as county staff, but we have neighborhood people. As different projects arise in different neighborhoods, we have representatives at the table. So the SPRC was formed in the early 1970s at the request of the county board as a committee, a subcommittee of the planning commission. And we review all the site plans, major site plan amendment requests, and we try to resolve site plan issues before the proposals go out to the public hearings for planning commission and the county board. Uh, as I noted, it's made up of planning commissioners as well as representatives from other boards and commissions and community groups, as well as the specific neighborhood representatives. We're very lucky on SPRC and planning commission in general that we get to work with a very talented and dedicated staff here in Arlington. We have folks from planning and we have some of our planning staff with us this evening, as well as other offices in the uh, planning housing development group, and those would include people from the housing group, people from historic preservation, from environmental services, our transportation planners, as well as people from park and rec, and other commissions, depending upon what the particular site plan is. Uh, at SPRC, we typically see technical drawings, such as architectural plans and elevations, landscape and transportation plans, rendering of street sections, engineering plans. In addition, SPRC members are expected to be familiar with Arlington County's general land use plan, sector plans, the zoning ordinance, design guidelines, site plan exception administrative process, which is commonly known as the 4.1 process, as well as num numerous technical standards related to street design, landscape design, and building and fire codes. We have tended to see over the last couple of years a lot of turnover on SPRC, both on planning commission as well as other commissions. And we found, I think, that not everyone is coming to the table with a similar base of knowledge. Sometimes SPRC members don't know all the terms that are being bandied about, like fenestration. And they may not have experience reading a set of plans. I know I didn't when I started on planning commission. Um, and we also might not even understand how our own professional staff looks at and evaluates plans and proposals that come into the county, and what criteria they apply in their professional life. So we've also found ourselves at SPRC getting really excited about a topic, and we want to really get into it, and then there's no time, because maybe we have an hour and a half. And we know that the time pressure to get a development through is, is there. We don't want to hold people up unnecessarily, but we also want to thoroughly discuss them. So we thought we'd set aside sort of a meeting just to be able to learn and discuss. Uh, and I hope that we have a lively conversation this evening. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chris Kreider from our urban design team. Chris? Thank you, uh, Nancy. Um, good evening, and thanks everyone for coming. I'm a planning supervisor for the urban design and research section of planning. Department and your host for this evening's discussion. Um, we all have opinions about what good design should and should not be. The question we need to ask ourselves is how can we move beyond expressing what we like or 
don't like about a project and start to explain why. So what, what is that recipe for a successful dialogue about design? And that's what we hope to achieve tonight is, is to is really understand how do we have a conversation about design? So <clears throat> let me pull up the agenda here. Uh, to assist in the understanding of the foundational elements utilized in the review of proposed developments. Tonight, the staff from the Urban Design Research Section within the Planning Division will lead us to an informed discussion. This is the first session of what we hope will be a series of discussions about the development process. And tonight is a two-part primer. Part one is dedicated to highlighting the principles of urban design and public space design along with contemporary best practices and trends. This will be followed by a discussion where you'll get to ask questions and make your own comments about design. Part two is an overview of how we apply these principles of good urbanism within the context of the county plans and policies that, that we filter this, these, these basic concepts through those plans, which have been very well thought out and very deliberated within the community. And we'll also close with some, some local projects that we feel like have really taken and are good examples of what we talk about when we talk about good urban design. So tonight's discussion is being taped um, and will soon be available on our planning web page. And we also are creating a resource library. So as we build this body of knowledge, uh, whether it be a good reading list or, or other examples, um, we want to have and make that accessible because as new commissioners uh, or people get involved in the community, we feel that they have an opportunity to learn about how to conduct the meetings and how to uh, understand about design and architecture could be very, make them a lot more comfortable. So who are we? Um, the Urban Design and Research section was created in 2013, and our purpose was to engage and educate the community on design, to serve as a resource to the development review staff, which is, we'll talk about that a lot tonight. We also work with consultants, developers, county leadership, and provide the technical expertise to ensure the highest quality of development is achieved in our evolving urban environment. The urban design section also serves as a technical design and data center for interdepartmental and interdivisional teams, and uh, it's a very highly, highly integrated approach. We, we uh, facilitate community engagement. Uh, we've had this, this uh, speaker series in the past. We host the Design Arlington Awards every two years, and we really want to bring this conversation of design and, and good quality uh, development to, to the community. So who are we? So I'd like to now take a moment to introduce our team. My name is, as I said, is Chris Kreider, and I joined Arlington County in 2013. Um, I, uh, I've been involved for 25 years in, in urban design and, and planning. Uh, I was formerly the planning director in, uh, in Kannapolis and Davidson, North Carolina, before moving to Arlington, where I live in Cherrydale, with my wife and two daughters. Uh, I earned a degree in architecture from the University of California, Berkeley, in 1994. We also have the, the woman who was helping us door, uh, Elizabeth Hardy. She's our county uh, chief demographer. Elizabeth holds an undergraduate degree in geography from George Mason University and a master's in urban and regional planning from Virginia Tech. She produces the official demographic and development statistics and, and tracks the new development. And, and works closely with Arlington, folks like Arlington Public Schools as we get our data and we share that with them so they can work on their student enrollment projections. Last year, she started the Northern Virginia Demographers Network, and which consists of research and GIS staff from all over Northern Virginia. And it's been a very good way to start to have that regional dialogue because so many of our jobs and in migration and out migration into the various localities is very important to track and it's important for all of Northern Virginia. We also have with us Kara Smith. Kara, raise your hand. Kara has uh, just recently uh, earned her license as a landscape architect, and she's an urban designer. She's been with the county since uh, June. And uh, her role at the county included landscape plan review. So post-approval, post Kara is very involved in reviewing those highly technical plans and making sure that the, the actual construction documents are consistent with what the board approved and the entitlements of the new grant. She received her bachelor's in landscape architecture from Cornell and has worked for the past four and a half years in, uh, in a small urban design and planning firm, 
landscape architecture firm in Saratoga, New York, and her focus was on streetscape design. Brent Wallace, to my left, is a landscape architect and an urban designer. He's responsible for design review and, and uh, implementing a wide variety of placemaking projects ranging from pop-up spaces to parks, plazas, and streetscapes. Before join, joining the county, uh, he worked as a designer in New York City in both the public and private sectors. Uh, Brett holds a degree in landscape architecture from Colorado State University and a degree in landscape turf management from, from Virginia Tech. He's a registered landscape architect in New York, is lead, and has an ISA certified artist. Uh, he lives in Silver Spring with his beautiful wife and two little girls, and I can vouch for that, with all three of them. <laughs> um, Justin Flango, on our left, is our chief architect and urban designer for Arlington County. Prior to 2013, Justin was a project director at Dover Pole and Partners in Miami, and he was also a designer uh, with Delaney Fire Cyber Company two very well-known uh, new urbanist firms. He has been involved with more than 40 design shreds throughout the United States and abroad, and also has taught architectural design at the University of Miami. He's a New England native, and has taught architectural, uh, I'm sorry, he's particularly interested in vernacular architecture and settlement patterns of the region. Uh, and actually, he shows some slides that I think validates his understanding of that. Justin received his BA in architecture from Lehigh University and two master's degrees of Miami in architecture and urban design. So what are we up to with the urban design section? Well, we like to get our hands dirty. Uh, we worked this past summer, you may have seen this, uh, this is our pop-up plaza in the courthouse square, the featured courthouse square. And we actually created this in two days. And it was a, really a fun effort to, uh, to, to reclaim some asphalt and to make a, a great place for people to sit. Um, another project that we're working on with uh, our, our colleagues in economic development and public art is the Boston Pedestrian Bridge, which will in the future be right across the street. <coughs> You'll start to see a trend here. This project we worked on with DPR, and this is a pop up park at the Korean Embassy. These are, I believe, Brett, these are your drawings that you worked on and, and developed those. And then uh, this is a project that, that Justin worked with our neighborhood services department. And uh, we had the folks from folks from NOC wanted to explore opportunities for what they could do with their their property, and, and we were very you know interested in helping. Most recently, um, we had a, a, a studio that I, all three of us were very involved in um, helping Virginia Tech students uh, reimagine the Roslyn waterfront. Produced a, a tremendous body of work, a lot of great ideas, and as, as time goes on, we will, I think visiting many of those ideas as we explore ways to connect. A more recent effort that Kara has been working on is the Mark study. So this is Mark's being Mark Great Affordable. And this is in Westover and identifying that and mapping that. So what you're seeing here is that what we do is we one, we work with a lot of different departments, and two, we provide that, that, that graphic and technical support that normally you have to go outside of the county to a consultant and pay a lot of money for. We have our own in-house studio. And finally, Elizabeth has, for many years, been working uh, to produce a, a, a vast collection of, of tracking data and, and then putting that into very legible and informative reports that real estate industry uses. Um, and a lot of people who are very interested in the development of Arlington, this is their go-to, many of these are their go-to resources for the facts. So now that you know who we are, let me take just a second to describe our goals for this forum. One, we want to have a, we want to make this a, a, an ongoing community conversation and about urban design. So we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we want to provide an orientation to what the building blocks are of your urban. We also want to talk about the art of creating a sense of place through enclosure. And and through that, as well as once you create that sense of enclosure. How do you understand the basic fundamentals of your open space design? How do you make the, those, those spaces come to life? We're also going to learn about how those different open spaces experiences can vary from very passive to very active, hardscape to softscape, intimate to explosive. And finally, um, one of our goals, and, and I've, I've worked with planning commissions for a long time. I see our planning commissions now as an ally of the staff. Because 
the, the community is, is a reflection of where we want to go. And it's also an important reflection of where we've been. And that partnership, that collaboration is what makes great cities. It's the strong leadership that we have, the, the talented staff, and a very engaged community. And if we're all working in the same direction, we can do amazing things. So one of the goals of this is to really reinforce the notion that this is a collaboration. And, uh, and I think once you start doing that, what you do is you, you start to create great spaces. So hopefully we come away with some strong fundamentals and we build your appetite for better design solutions and provide you, our citizen leaders, with the tools you need to better express your thoughts to staff. So giving you that language, giving you that understanding of how we look at things, hopefully you'll feel more assertive and, and, and uh, more articulate, if you will, about what it is that you like and don't like be able to put those into words that then can make, make our project move forward. So tonight, as we begin this new series of uh, discussions, we encourage the planning commissions and other community members to share their thoughts. And we hope you come away with a better understanding of the fundamentals of design, how it serves to create great spaces and, space, and places. It makes us proud to be a part of an ongoing transformation in Arlington County. I will now turn things over to Justice Flango, our chief county architect, and We'll All right, so if we're going to be talking about urban design tonight, um, I think it's important for us to sort of have a common understanding of what is meant by the word urban to begin with. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they think of the word urban, they think of a picture like this. Um, you know, this great conglomeration of development, um, a lot of activity, um, you know, uh, very dense, uh, very tall buildings. Um, but that's, and, that, and this is indeed an urban place, um, but there's other places that are also urban. Um, so this, for example, just this tiny village in the countryside, a few houses together, um, that is also something that is urban. Um, you know, it's a, a group of houses that have been intentionally arranged together, they, they all face one another, they create spaces. Um, you can even see in here, even though there's probably only four or five houses there, there's a little chapel here. Looks like a little cemetery, um, so there's some some civic moves, some civic um, spaces in there as well. Um, so there's there's more to urbanism than just that. There's a uh, urbanism is, is is an intentional and, and a social arrangement of buildings and of, of places. Um, and even a single house in the countryside can also be incredibly urban, just based on the way it's it's laid out. Um, so Mount Vernon, you know, very close to here. Um, and I, I happen to think that this forecourt here in front of the house is actually incredibly urban. Um, presents a you know, very uh, rather stoic front. Um, there's an arrangement of, of several buildings that create a, a space in the front of the house. Um, and there's a roadway that sort of intentionally comes and goes around that front space there. Um, so there's, there's more to urbanism than just very dense, large cities. Um, but then there's, there's lots of things, just because there's development, it, there's also things that aren't urban. Um, so, you know, strip malls and um, suburban uh, houses often aren't, aren't very urban at all. They're not very social. Um, there's, uh, you know, the strip mall here, it's actually set very far back from the street. Um, there's a lot of asphalt there. Uh, the house is there in, in the bottom right-hand corner. You know, they, rather than presenting sort of their front doors to the street and uh, porches and, and windows, um, and so all you see is garages. So there's, there's actually, in, in a way, it's actually very antisocial. Um, so what is urban design? Urban design is a, a multidisciplinary field. I mean, also, you know, you have to have a, a, a little bit of knowledge about a lot of different things. You have to understand transportation, you have to understand building, you have to understand public spaces. Um, urban design is also about complete networks. So. Um, Pedestrian networks, vehicular networks, hydrological, environmental, um, you know, the system of how everything fits together. Um, most importantly, I think, is it's, it's about the placement of buildings to, us, to shape meaningful spaces. Um, and there's a, the important part also is that the space between the buildings is also important. So what is the design of hardscapes and landscapes and, and streetscapes? Um, and then certainly considerations about what the implications are for how we're laying things out, what are the economic, social, and cultural implications of those. Um, so I, just to kind of take a little step back here, um, let's look at the sort of fundamental building blocks of cities, which are, which are neighborhoods. Um, 
And the diagram on the left and, and on the right are diagrams that are actually in, uh, every architect has on their desk uh, architectural graphic standards. And at the front of that, that book, and then this is a book that people have had for, for decades, architects have had for decades, um, at the front of it, there's a, a, a series of uh, pages that have sort of reference, general reference materials. Um, and in it, on the, on the left side, is a, um, a drawing that was done in the 20s by a planner called Clarence Perry. Um, and it outlines what, it, what are the fundamental um, characteristics of a neighborhood, particularly in a, in a city. Um, and that, that diagram has since been updated, um, and so that the diagram now on the right appears in, in every um, architect's handbook. Um, but fundamentally, neighborhoods have not changed. Uh, they haven't changed for centuries. They haven't changed for millennia. Um, there's, there's things that they all have to come up. Um, all great cities are made up of a series of neighborhoods. Paris has its, its neighborhoods, and indeed Arlington also has its neighborhoods, and they, they follow the same patterns. Um, neighborhoods all tend to have certain things in common. Um, they're generally of a walkable scale. Um, there's some kind of identifiable center and an identifiable edge to where the neighborhood is. Um, often, particularly in a city, the edge of a neighborhood is, is a large arterial or some kind of natural feature. Um, there's often spaces uh, set aside for uh, civic buildings, special buildings, um, for public spaces, for recreation, um, small neighborhood parks. Um, there's places for commerce, and there's also a mix of, of different housing types within the, within the neighborhoods. Um, just talking a little bit about also how, how cities are put together. Um, there's fabric buildings and there's object buildings in cities. Um, and you, you can't have a city made up exclusively of, fa of, of object buildings um, or sort of special civic buildings. Just like you can't have a city that's made up of only fabric buildings or background buildings or private buildings. It's really a combination of the two together that really make a city. Um, that's sort of exemplified even by Washington, D.C. There's the Mill Macmillan plan. Um, and you can see sort of the pink blocks. Those are sort of the fabric blocks of the city. That's the, uh, the, the privately owned parcels, the, the, the place where sort of people live, where people work. Um, but you can see identified in those plans are special places for the civic buildings, um, the ones that are sort of in black, and in, in particular some of the monuments that are in red. Um, and the plan for Chicago from 1909 also uh, takes a similar approach to that. Um, as you can see, the sort of the, the hundreds of blocks of streets. Um, and it's not to mean that those, those buildings don't necessarily have their own embellishments. Um, but the job of those fabric buildings really is to kind of hold the street edge and to actually create all those public spaces. Um, and then within those public spaces, or in, set aside in certain blocks or those places for those, those special civic buildings, um, one key thing about urban environments is they, they tend to have enclosure. Um, that's sort of a very important feature of, of urbanism. Um, the, the idea of having outdoor, sort of outdoor rooms, if you will. Um, and they're the spaces that people naturally feel comfortable in. Um, there are certain proportions of streets as well that, that tend to have a good feeling to them. Um, the diagram in the upper, upper um, middle there is, is sort of a proportion of about a one-to-one. Um, so the, the side of the building is about equal to the, the width of the, the space between the two buildings. So that's something that you might see, for example, in a typical Parisian street. Uh, it's a very comfortable proportion of street to have. Uh, the left side is a very tight street, so you might see that in a more medieval city, like in Italy or in France. Um, and the right side is about a one to two ratio. That's also a very comfortable environment. Um, and that's something that maybe you would see in a typical American main street. So again, sort of the idea that while the buildings themselves are important and what they look like is important, it's really the space that those buildings are making that's really the, the, the key factor uh, in urban design. And it's not always uh, buildings that have to make those spaces. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see that's maybe more of a, a residential neighborhood, but really what makes that street space is the street trees along the edges of it. Um, or in a build, you know, in a, 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 an environment where you maybe have taller buildings, um, where you have places that the buildings step back at a certain level, it sort of uh, keeps the proportions of the, the pedestrian environment down by the street level a little bit more comfortable. Um, so those are those are the places that people like to be. They like to be in those those sort of more enclosed environments. Um, and it really doesn't matter. There are certain fundamental things that the architecture has to do, um, but really it doesn't matter what the style of the architecture is. It could be very modern. It could be very traditional. But as long as 
you have that enclosure and there's certain basic things that are happening in those buildings, um, you're going to get happy pedestrians. Um, it's not only about the, the, the size of the street, but it's also about what's happening at the end. Um, so ideally, you like to have uh, terminated vistas, as we call them. Um, so this is an example from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, this is one that, that was actually done very intentionally. The, uh, the, the church there, St. Philip's Church, uh, actually pulls forward and, and sort of interrupts the street. Um, the street sort of wiggles around it. And so from both sides of it, you actually get this, this terminated view um, on the steeple of the church. So it sort of gives you a sense of place, it gives you a sense of enclosure, um, and it can be done in a more subtle way as well. Uh, this is an example from Copenhagen. Um, in this example, there isn't an intentional building that's been placed at the end, but instead the, the street turns ever so slightly around, um, so you still get that, that enclosure at the end. Um, thinking about building front, which as I mentioned about, um, you know, there's certain fundamental things that it's important for buildings to do. Um, in a retail frontage, um, you, you want to make sure you have things like transparency, you want to be able to have some kind of interaction between pedestrians on the sidewalk and what's going on inside of the uh, restaurants or shops. Um, you want to have frequent doors, um, that's also important. So even in an environment where you have a lot of glass, um, if there aren't entrances in and out of the uh, establishments, then there's a certain um, vitality that's lost. Um, and then there's other things that go along with the streetscape that kind of help to embellish it, things like awnings and signage, it kind of adds to the liveliness. Um, and again, the, the architecture doesn't really matter. You can have really successful urban places in, in a variety of architectural styles. Here's a more traditional example, but it sort of adheres to the same principles, frequent doors and windows. Um, this one has the added bonus of sort of a recessed entryway to the retail space. Um, but the building is doing a really good job of setting up that, that uh, that sort of pedestrian environment um, down at the, the sidewalk level. One key thing for retail frontages, um, and you can see on the, on the left side here is a, a photograph from Walnut Street in Philadelphia. It's a very busy retail street. And you can see there's a variety of buildings. The buildings change in scale slightly as they sort of go down the street. Um, but it's very continuous. Um, there's, there's, there are no interruptions to that, to that retail frontage, and that's really key um, to getting good, successful retail streets, especially for pedestrians. Um, the key to this one, and you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, there's just sort of an aerial of that, the red lines with the marks where Walnut Street is. The thing that makes that possible, that continuous retail frontage possible, is that all the service and all the back of the house stuff is happening um, behind the buildings. So this, uh, behind Walnut Street, there's a series of alleys on both sides where all that back of house stuff happens, um, and sort of it frees up the, the street for uh, for all that pedestrian activity. Uh, residential frontages also have certain things that they need to do in an urban environment um, to be successful. Um, on the right side, ideally it's better to have, uh, especially when buildings are closer to the sidewalk, it's ideal to have the first finished floor raised up just a little bit. Um, it gives you a little bit of privacy. Um, you tend to have more eyes on the street that way. People tend to close their blinds and their, their curtains more or, or less frequently. Uh, because they're not as concerned about, uh, you know, privacy. Um, but when buildings do, like on the left side, when they do need to be right at the ground level, um, even just pushing the building back slightly um, gives a little bit of that privacy. Uh, but again, the principle of having frequent doors and windows is very important. Um, with, with public spaces, um, this is a, an image from Savannah from the early 1700s, and this is when Savannah was first sort of ripped from the frontier. Um, and as you can see, you've got to start thinking about these things very early on, lines that you draw on plans and, um, and that you start to create with streets and spaces. Um, they last a really long time, and sometimes they also take a very long time to mature. Um, so you can see in this image, um, even back, back then, when there was probably only you know, 30 or 40 families here, you can see that the squares of Savannah are actually already visible there. Um, and the houses, even though they're only single family houses at this stage, um, the houses are also doing a really good job of, uh, of actually fronting onto the street and defining those spaces. Um, and so over time, that's Savannah today. Um, the, the fundamental grid and the blocks have not changed, um, but over time it's matured and it's actually gotten better with time rather than worse. Um, Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia, sort of the same concept. Um, the square's been there for a very long time, and over time, as building, uh, additional buildings have come in, it's actually just made the space better and better. Um, 
One interesting thing on this one, you can see the building kind of on the left hand side, there's one building that's kind of not playing along with the others. Um, and it actually becomes, you know, in a situation like this, it actually becomes very noticeable when a building intentionally sort of uh, pulls itself away from fronting that, that public space and from helping to define that space. Um, so, kind of set up the, the framework there, you know, the box and street pattern. Um, and Brett's going to talk a little bit about now the space between the buildings and what are some important design considerations for um, streetscapes and for open spaces that some of those buildings define. Thank you, Justin. So as Justin set up uh, the framework um, for public spaces, I thought it would be good to start with uh, such a large urban park like Central Park in Manhattan. Um, and I'm going to have a series of slides that go through a lot of different examples, different scales, different sizes, and talk about the open space design and elements within those that differ and those that are similar. Um, and so again, building off of what Justin set up, uh, you can start to see how the buildings really do frame Central Park on all sides. And you know, while when you're inside of the park, the scale is so vast you don't really recognize that. Um, you know, playing off the grid here and the street pattern, and those buildings really do work to shape this larger space. But while inside of it, you get you get lost, um, uh, you know, and you get really in touch with nature and feel like it's really an escape from the, the, the urban core and city. Um, so everything from a, a large urban park like this at 843 acres, all the way down to a small pocket park like this, Paley Park, which is uh, only a few blocks away from Central Park, you have the same principles here. You see enclosure on all sides. Um, and there's movable seating, trees. Again, uh, the water bowl in the back really serves as an element of uh, white noise that really draw, uh, drowns out the noise from the bustling urban environment on the street. But again, you know, people come here to escape um, the hustle and bustle and just daydream, have lunch, and what have you. And the same thing holds true for a, a large park like Central Park. Um, and you know. Urban design and, and public space design it comes in all shapes and sizes, and this is just an example from Portland, Oregon, of a small uh, one-acre uh, or neighborhood-oriented uh, park, um, which again has a variety of different features, water elements. There's lots of lush landscaping along the edges, um, and you know how does that all come together to create a great place? And this is the, this is a picture from the same park, and you can start to see that water feature on the left. Um, which is really this kind of active social zone where people are meeting up in the morning, having coffee, watching their kids play. Whereas on the other side, it's a more green and passive space with a lot of landscaping to create uh, shade and, and buffer. Um, there's high hierarchy and pathways that run through the park. Um, and then the buildings in front of the park really uh, serve as eyes on the, the space, so a, a, a form of visual surveillance. And I couldn't have a presentation without having a picture of the High Line, um, but I think it is really a great example of um, repurposing infrastructure, but also um, of how urban designers are connecting communities and also spurring economic development. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. It's not built yet, but this is the 11th Street Bridge Park. This is a rendering uh, across the Anacostia River. Um, so again, repurposing existing infrastructure to turn it into public open spaces is another way to help connect communities, um, this being uh, from the Navy Yard over to Anacostia. Um, this is an example in Dallas, Texas. Um, this uh, is Clyde Warren Park. I'm just going to flip back and forth here, but this is one really great example of a park that was completed a couple years ago where uh, they decked over this freeway and created this wonderful uh, 5.2 acre park that has a, a, a mixture of different programming and uses, but it really does help stitch together those communities on both sides where the freeway was really uh, you know, a, a scar in the neighborhood. So another great example um, of thinking outside of the box on how do we create great places when we don't have space to do that. Um, another really cool example is this uh, Pier 55. Um, this actually was approved by the Army Corps of Engineers to be, to be built on the Hudson River. Um, 
and uh, it's a series of uh, you know, peers and connections and topography. Um, it's, I think, about two and a half acres. Um, so really innovative thinking that needs to go into uh, urban design and place making. Um, and then also, we like to look at streets as places, too. So um, looking at our curb and sidewalk space, uh, curb extensions, this is an example of the top of uh, of a parklet, uh, which we're uh, hoping to uh, get implemented soon in our uh, Roslyn neighborhood, working with the Roslyn bid. Um, but also looking at cafes and streetscapes and you know, uh, creating that, that vibrant atmosphere on the street um, with uh, plenty of seating and, <coughs> and space and you know, places for people to bump shoulders and, and socialize. Um, also, uh, you may be familiar with some of these examples that are happening all over the country. This again in, in New York um, is repurposing street space where we had just an abundance of asphalt and how we can convert that into uh, usable public space um, that's really uh, active and lively as well. And then um, as urban designers and, and park planning, um, we're always looking at uh, supporting active lifestyles, so looking at um, play features, whether they're um, kind of off-the-shelf play features like this or more um, innovative uh, play spaces. Um, in integrating uh, recreation into our parks and open spaces is very important, again, trying to support a healthy lifestyle. Uh, this is an example from uh, Washington, D.C. over at the Navy Yard. This is the Canal Park. Um, it's a, a park that is uh, three blocks. And, um, it's uh, a work in progress. The park was complete, but as you can see on the uh, east side there, um, there are some vacant lots, um, which is slated for uh, redevelopment in the future. Um, but this park has a lot of really great elements. There's, there's a water feature, there's cafes, there's green roofs, there's a lot of sustainable elements. During the winter time, this is converted into an ice skating ribbon, um, so it activates the space in the winter. There's uh, passive green spaces. There's you know, harvesting of uh, rainwater and reuse for irrigation, um, native vegetation, a lot of movable furniture, um, and uh, some shared or tabletop streets that really act as a traffic calming uh, device to kind of slow people down and also uh, provide more usable space. Um, so this is just a diagram, I know it's kind of hard to see, but this is the same park. Um, so you can see the three segments of the park um, and the future development. These are just uh, conceptual models, obviously, but uh, the idea for this park is really to be a living system. It's really about harvesting runoff from those future buildings, integrating it into the park, treating it, reusing it for irrigation, flushing of toilets, um, and things of that nature. And so it's really about thinking about this whole park as a system and how it can really be a truly sustainable place in the future. And a lot of this really isn't evident when you're in this space. A lot of this stuff and these pipes, it's all infrastructure that's below ground that you, you don't really notice and, until you see something like this or you just do the research. But um, a lot of this goes into our public spaces planning. So how does that get applied to the streetscape? Well, this is an example in the Noma neighborhood DC, uh, I think it's Constitution Square, there's a Harris team in there, you may be familiar with it, but they've integrated stormwater uh, fire retention planters into the sidewalk. It's a very wide sidewalk, so you've got cafe seating on the, on the building frontage and native vegetation, um, so it's very green. There's plantings, there's places to sit. Um, just another example of how uh, stormwater can be integrated into the streetscape with permeable papers and other materials. Um, also, a lot of our buildings that we see here uh, being built in Arlington have uh, green roofs, um, you know, striving to achieve LEED um, credit. And uh, you know, this is an example from uh, Washington, D.C. and the ASLA headquarters. Um, but other creative ways to introduce green and landscape into our uh, rooftop terraces and amenity spaces. <clears throat> and at a larger or district-wide uh, scale, um, this is a study that was done after Hurricane Sandy um, really had a tremendous impact on Lower Manhattan. But looking at how stormwater and infrastructure can all be integrated on a district-wide scale and how we can really plan for resilient cities in the future, so it almost acts like a sponge that can handle the rising tides of the future. So again, forward thinking, um, we 
using an infrastructure and smaller is, is key. So going back to the, the framework, this is a uh, Paris. This is a, a figure ground a diagram. And, and for those of you who don't know what that term is, it's, it's using uh, the black as the building mass to show the building form. You start to see the open spaces that are defined in streets. Um, and I know it's kind of hard to see, but some of the parks here are colored in. Um, so again, it's, it's all about creating a system of, of places. Um, and I think even if you start to zoom into some of these spaces where there's triangular, where two streets meet, there are other open spaces that are within this greater system um, that may not be evident from this plan. But that whole idea of networks and, and spaces, creating squares and places within the city is key. Um, a lot of times uh, during our site plan review, we, I think we have a hard time understanding scale. And so we think about public spaces, we have to understand scale. Um, Justin had some slides earlier about proportion and enclosure and how these spaces are framed, but then, you know, what might you see in a, a square that's, uh, you know, a third of an acre versus a place that's an acre like Jameson Square up in the upper right, or Pershing Square in Los Angeles. So uh, understanding scale is very important. We use these studies a lot and we encourage a lot of applicants um, to look at uh, places, not only across the country, but here in Arlington. And so bringing this back to Arlington, I thought it would be a good idea to look at the Penn Place uh, PDSP project that was approved um, in 2013. Um, because it really does, um, you know, this was in the design guidelines that were approved, but it really does kind of uh, speak back to um, the earlier principles that we were discussing about blocks and streets and open spaces and connections and how those spaces are connected and start to form a greater network. And so you can see the blocks and the new street, 12th Street in this case, on the left, uh, how to link open spaces. So you've got Met Park on the south, the new pin, or the future pin place to the north. And then how those future buildings start to kind of frame those spaces. So you can see in Met Park, there's, you know, the buildings are framing that interior space as will uh, with the future development of pin place to the north and then how that all kind of uh, fits together in this final composite diagram on the left. Uh, this is just a concept design that was approved as part of that master planning process. And I just wanted to go through some of the, the, the principles and, and talk about the arrangement of these elements. Uh, I know this is a, a larger urban place, but I think a lot of those same principles apply to a lot of other spaces. But I think um, before we get into that, you know, it's certainly important when looking at these spaces, and thinking about design in the early phase is to look at the context, not only look at scale of other places, but also look at what's around. What, what kind of other amenities are in these public spaces? What's missing? What do we need? And you know, a lot of this will come out of the, um, the public spaces master plan process that's currently underway today. So, um, and again, in the case of Pin Place, uh, the first you know, uh, plaza or urban public space off of 12th Street was this 12th Street Plaza. We, we started to look at the size of that and what that meant. So it's about you know, a third of an acre we start looking at Penrose Square, uh, Pentagon Row, Welburn Square. These are all spaces I'm sure you're all familiar with. And so we start to see, you know, what's going on there? You know, what kind of amenities in the space and what can we really achieve here in this public plaza? But again, just another example of how we need to look at scale um, when we're thinking about public space design. And then not only this, the scale of the space itself that's formed by the buildings and the street, but the scale of the elements that are within those spaces. So understanding how big basketball court is, or a, you know, a bocce court, or, or a playground, um, or even a, a soccer field, um, and understanding, you know, how that might fit or not fit in the space that is currently, you know, being reviewed. Um, you know, going back to pin place, I think as designers, um, you know, it's always, it starts with inspiration. Um, at least it should, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, in this case, Olin was the designer for uh, the master plan, and they were looking at nature for inspiration. So looking at stones and the shape of stones and how those might be mimicked in the landscape, whether in a landscape bed or circulation, uh, or sticks and how they kind of start to stack on top of one another. You'll see in the concept diagrams um, how that all fits. And so they 
what I found interesting was they came up with these four concepts, the stone, sticks, bank, and current. And if you look at the design, the stone is kind of uh, mimics that shape of that round kind of beach pebble stone. The sticks plays off of all the different circulation patterns, the, the desire lines within the space itself. Um, ultimately, the, the sticks concept was chosen to move forward. Um, so in this diagram, uh, the 12th, 12th Street is on the bottom. Uh, but it was important that came out through the process was how do you get people into the interior of the space? How do you activate that interior open space? Um, and so what they came up with was a series of uh, paths with different hierarchy in terms of width, um, but also you know, going back to Justin's point about having a terminating vista. In this case, it was the uh, a cafe that was proposed, but so this is a rendering uh, from 12th Street looking in, going into the site. But you know, then how do you start to uh, arrange elements off of that strong axis that you're now forming? And so, these are just a series of diagrams that start to layer on how everything starts to really shape and define that space. First, looking at vegetation. I mean, you can use trees to do a lot on the landscape um, to help frame views, um, provide shade, obviously, but a um, very powerful way of, of um, cre creating another uh, sense of enclosure within the space without having buildings. Um, open lawn, it was important to have very flexible uh, space here for events and concerts of that nature. Uh, seasonal planting around the edges, creating uh, you know, seasonal interest um, with topography. There's the cafe I mentioned, different water elements. Everything is really organized off of that main central axis. Um, sculptural elements, the children's play area, for example, was, was located adjacent to the cafe. So the kids are playing over here. You could be sitting over there with your friends having a coffee. Um, so it all makes sense how all these things really fit together, um, but you know it's not until you start seeing it in this kind of form that it makes sense. Um, public art again having very visual um, locations of public art, very prominent, uh, anchoring the corners and you know, again creating a terminal vistas. Um, but then also looking at the greater space itself, going back to kind of the scale and the program is. You know, thinking about like how many people we're going to fit in this space if we have a concert. So looking at diagrams like this, I think was uh, very helpful in this process and um, could be helpful going forward in other large open space uh, projects as well. And so this, you know, resulted in ultimately this concept plan. And we all know that you know, going forward, this will come in with new site plan development. You know, we'll have SBRC meetings. We'll look at this in greater detail. And then at that point, we really start to drill down into the site. We start to understand uh, design a little bit more, the intention of materials and pattern, um, paving and landscaping. So we'll get to see all that later. Um, but uh, I thought I'd drill down here, at least get you thinking about pattern in the landscape. This is one example of how the uh, landscape architect took the pattern of the building and reflected it down into the plaza space which I, I found was a very uh, neat idea. And this is just a close-up of that space. So you start to see the pattern, uh, the texture, of how the planting beds are formed to create those outdoor rooms and create intimate spaces within that large public plaza. And then we start to look at pattern and texture. Um, this is another example from uh, Cornell uh, University, but you start to, you know, Make, you know, common sense stuff, you just follow desire lines of people. People, you know, don't walk at right angles. You know, people want to enter uh, spaces like this at the corners. You know, where are people going? I mean, you have to really think about how people move through the space. Um, you know, this being a campus, I mean, there's a lot of paving here, but uh, you can see around the edges, there's a lot of texture and topography and planting and, and the richness of the stone and uh, the materials that were used, the wood of the benches that really gives a sense of warmth um, to this uh, campus plaza. And again, you know, going back to that hierarchy of paths, you can see this example here, similar to the Penn Place example, where you have a wider path that's really uh, serving as a strong axis and linkage from the, the retail at the top of the screen to this uh, great water feature um, in the foreground here. And then how those other secondary paths start to create spaces, more usable spaces for uh, 
looking at your form and order and emphasis, here you have a combination of the formal row of trees, really uh, creating that direct uh, vista and axis. You've got public art, this, these kind of archways giving emphasis and the color of the furniture, the, you know, the textures and the paving on the ground plane, all of that work together to, to make this uh, uh, prominent space that we see here. Um, and then, you know, in contrast to a direct form of circulation, we have these more organic forms of circulation where it's more of a meandering experience through a park, and there's elements of discovery where you turn a corner and you, uh, you come up to an open lawn that opens up a brand new view to something great. Um, and there's topography. There's a lot of ways to shape landscapes to create interest in the three dimensions. Um, not just thinking about everything in terms of having a flat space. Um, this example uh, is, is a great example of how to blend the passive and active spaces that we, we hear a lot of in uh, our meetings. Um, and this is a residential project, um, but here in the foreground is very passive lawn areas for picnicking, throwing the ball with the kid, or, or what have you. But then as you see, there's a tunnel right here that goes through this actually uh, man-made kind of out, uh, rock outcropping. And as you go through that tunnel, there's this really active uh, play space that has this really cool slide built into the topography. There's, there's sand, there's, there's water features, there's just natural stone, there's these pathways that kind of lead you up. Um, again, other ways to just kind of get lost uh, from the city and kind of experience nature. And, you know, this, I, I love this image because it really shows you the tension between ge uh, these hexagonal papers, the geometry, and this, this, this man-made kind of bank of boulders and grasses. So it almost looks like, you know, this was here first and, and they just paved up against it. But it's really that tension between the natural and the man-made that uh, is really uh, intriguing about this image. Um, with landscapes, we, you know, we always see the renderings with the trees and the flowers, but we have to think about the spaces in the wintertime. So, you know, here we have a water feature with these really cool jagged stones to kind of jump on whatever wave, you know, very shallow water depth. But, you know, in the wintertime, you've got this great contrast with the snow and, and the water, um, adding an element of, you know, visual interest. And this is just another example from Harvard University. These stones are very popular with the students. We're sitting around, there's a, there's a mist fountain um, but in the wintertime, I'm also, you know, thinking about um, the contrast of uh, materials. And this is an example uh, of Dilworth Park in Philadelphia. That's, uh, this is City Hall here. This is a, a new plaza that was recently completed. Um, but what's interesting about this space, it is a lot of hardscape. I will admit that. But um, it is uh, the site of a lot of, and it's their really civic space. So there's a lot of room for gathering, there's a cafe uh, anchoring this end, um, there's a water feature, but if you notice this kind of squiggly lines that go through here, this is really um, a representation of the subway lines that are running below the plaza, um, and actually the designers work with an artist, um, you can see in this rendering here, um, to animate this space at night, those, those uh, lines light up. Uh, whenever the trains are passing below, um, which is a really neat element. Um, there's some other small examples of how public art can help activate space and also um, just be contemplative in general. Um, the Bean in Chicago, I think a lot of people have seen that in the Linear Park, very large scale, but there's also ways to have you know, sculptural seating. Um, there's temporary art, which also is another fantastic way to uh, animate the space. Um, and then other In terms of tree canopy in space, uh, what I found interesting about this image, you know, it's, it's a grove of trees. But if you look at this on a plan, you're probably going to say, well, how are people going to use this space? But if you look at it, and these trees are mature, and they're, they're limbed up, and you know, creating this great canopy in this room, if you will, um, it really is a great space. I mean, not only provides shade, um, but you know, trees on a plan don't always mean unusable space. People can still get underneath the trees and enjoy that. Trees can also be used for visual interest, whether it's uh, fall color, I have this example here, just that big yellow uh, birch trees here that kind of anchor that 
that bend in the path, but the public seating that wraps around there, offering a lot of different opportunities for public seating is important. And again, you have some topography, just more visual interest in general. Uh, it also translates to the landscape. Uh, you know, there's textures and you know, thinking about plant material. Um, a lot of times, you know, post approval, when we're looking at these landscape plants, we're looking at all these species and how all these species are working together, and you know what they might look like in the winter time. This is a, a red twig dogwood, which has this really great contrast with the snow. And so we're just thinking about the, you know different fruits and you know ever having a, you know a good mix of evergreen plantings to add interest in the winter time as well. And then there's always you know more naturalistic styles of planting, thinking about uh, you know color and the seasons. This is an example from uh, the Lurie Garden in Chicago, but uh, you know, these perennials, you know, they, they bloom every spring and it forms this purple wave through the landscape. And people come here and, you know, it's just something about celebrating the different seasons and using plant materials. Um, so a lot of that, that thought has to be put into design as well. And we as staff are always looking at that. Getting back to the streetscape. So this is a shot from the city center in DC. You know, how does it all come together? I mean, you can start to see different papers uh, and patterns used to define different zones. Um, you can start to see seasonal color and interest in the landscape and the tree beds and the furniture. Um, getting back to Justin's points about the frontage, you've got great transparency, signage. Um, the scale is, is really is really human scale. And so um, when we start talking about the streetscape, that's what we are looking to do. We really want to create a human scale. Things that are really tangible at eye level. Uh, these are the things that people really notice the most. I mean, certainly you know, appreciating a great building from a distance, but really when you're walking down the street, this is what you're experiencing. When you're really experiencing that building wall, what's on, what's happening on the ground plane, uh, on the curbside, whether it's parking or bike lanes. Um, so again, paying a lot of attention to the detail. And we, we get into this discussion a lot in our plan review and this is kind of the typical uh, streetscape, if you will. You have the building frontage. We've got what we call the shy zone or the spill-out zone, so where usually the cafes are. And there are some instances where we have cafes on the uh, curbside as well, and that works well. It, it's done in Crystal City, Sherlington. It's done in Bethesda Row, if you've been there. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to both, um, but you know, thinking about these two zones for different uses, uh, is important as well. And there's the clear path, um, which is important. Um, and, you know, we don't have a magic formula for what's the right dimension for the clear path. I mean, the general rule of thumb, I think, is between 8 and 12 feet, depending on the context and the pedestrian volume. Um, and then the furnishings are along the curb, usually where all the street trees are, the infrastructure, the street lights, the trash cans, the benches, uh, utilities, hydrants. Um, bicycle racks, uh, you name it. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that go into the design of that space. And so other considerations that think about, you know, the, the standoff distance from the curb, is there enough room for somebody to get out of the car when they park? And then the arrangement of all those elements, so just a lot of attention to the detail on the, the clearances and how everything's placed and how everything makes sense with creating a consistent streetscape. Um, in terms of seating, of course, uh, the success of public spaces really falls back on a lot of having a variety of seating, looking at the ergonomics of seating, understanding what the proper height is, what the angle is for the backrest. Um, and then trees in terms of soil volume, understanding what it takes to support a healthy as a tree. So this, these are just some diagrams to show the amount of soil volume needed to, to get those large canopy trees and what impact that has on the streetscape design in terms of dimensions and spacing. Um, other innovative ways to look at uh, increasing soil volume with trees with these uh, suspended uh, suspended pavement by these uh, crates here that's filled with uncompacted soil. Uh, understanding paving textures and uh, you know, understanding accessibility in terms of paving design. Lighting, of course we have our standard street lights, but there's other ways to look at lights above and on the ground plane to help animate spaces at night. And then lastly, uh, wayfinding and signage, uh, very important. Um, and you know, a lot of our spaces are you know, not even known to be public, so even simple 
signs like this on the, on the side of a building um, can help uh, encourage more use of uh, privately owned public spaces. So with that, I think we're going to okay. open it up to discussion. So what we'd like to do now is to uh, invite you guys to come up front here and have a conversation about what you just saw. Uh, we'd love to hear some questions, some comments from folks. Steve, you want to join us too? And uh, so I would, I would I'd be happy to ask the first question. Uh, you talked a lot about design and you working as designers. Uh, Justin, you've worked in the private sector, when, and you've worked on the developer side, you've worked on the public side. As a designer, are you, does it all just come from within, or is it really a response to your client or the community's wishes that shapes the work that you do? I would say fundamentally it is based on what the community wants, um, but I think um, what I've found, um, having worked in a lot of different places, you sort of learn, in addition to sort of hearing what communities want to see in their own um, in their own place, you sort of learn a little bit from each community as well. There's something that Arlington is doing really well that communities all across the country aren't doing really well. And so I think when, especially as like a consultant, you know, you might come and work in Arlington, and while you're helping Arlington solve some problems, you might learn something that Arlington is doing really well, and you sort of take that to other places. Um, so I think it's sort of it's sort of a combination. You're responding to to the community, but you're also um, you're sort of learning a little bit from different places, and you're trying to apply those. You're, um, you know, it's, a lot of it is, is precedent things. You know, learning from other places. Okay. Does anybody have a question? Who wants to ask the first question or make the first comment? Um, Justin, I to follow on what Chris was saying, with all the things that you and Brett showed us. So those are the principles that, that you all have as, as an architect, as a landscape designer. So when we have a project that comes in in Arlington, is I take it that you use those to inform your reactions to what you're seeing from an applicant as well as probably our adopted sector plans? And, and what is your interaction? How, how is it that you go back and forth with the development community, because you know, clearly their architects work for them. You know they have a client, but as you well noted, that Arlington has a community and has some standards, and we have some adopted plans. So how does that interaction work, even before we see it at the SPRC table? Well, I think first and foremost, we always look to if there's any adopted plans or policies that we have in place already. Those are the very first things that we always sort of check um, new development proposals against. Um, and then beyond that, you know, there's uh, there may be things that potentially those plans don't address, or they're kind of left open, or um, then I think we sort of need to use our own judgment to sort of determine whether things are appropriate or if they're not appropriate, or um, if there's things that developers need to work on. Um, any, any questions or comments from back here? Uh, 
am I missing something? But it just strikes me that we could um, that we could use that agenda more effectively um, if, we, if we somehow had a focus on how does this building, what public space does it create? Is it a, does it create a functioning public space? Do, do people understand it's a public space? Um, what are the views to it, through it? Um, and how does the building contribute or detract from the possibility of a, a successful public space? So looking a little bit more at the context of the building rather than, okay, well here's the site, this is where it's located, and then just jumping right into the building details. It's certainly good to step back and kind of look at how the building kind of fits into the environment, what are the buildings that are adjacent to it um, in terms of scale and the space that it makes and the streetscape in front of it, certainly all valid points. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add something. You know, sometimes we get very formula-based when we're talking about open space and a lot of the clubs and wing ordinances say, oh, well, on this, on this site you have to have 10% open space or 20% open space. But numbers are really I know we've been around the country, if you've looked, you've seen a lot of plazas and cities which are more open or absolutely dead. Activity, or very cold, or just unenjoyable at all. So we have to look beyond percentages and really look at it. And I think Justin covered it pretty well. Is that you know what, what kind of what kind of spaces are we creating? Um, because it's, it's it's easy. To, you know, there, there, there's some there, there's some places here in here in Arlington where you know it's it's open space and it looks nice, but it's not used. You know, so. That's, that's part of our role is to take a look at some of these projects and say, look, you do this or you do that, which would make a much more interesting space. And I know we have a project coming up later on our slides, a project was recently approved that I think is really going to be spectacular. Here we have a question over here or a comment. I would have to follow on to what Jane is saying because I think from our perspective, from those of us that will sit in on the SPRC process from the Park and Rec Commission, open space is always the last thing agenda, oftentimes kind of an asterisk. And, you know, we totally agree with what, what Brett and Justin were talking about. They really do need to create these spaces, and I'm not sure we're doing that very well because we're, it's an afterthought right now from our perspective, and we'd love to see that really bumped up. Excellent point. I think uh, we've just been recently working on a design, and we didn't start with the buildings. We start with the network. We start with the arrangement and uh, the, the streets, and what are we connecting to, where are the desire lines. And it's, it's, it's interesting how when uh, an applicant comes in, they have these very embellished renderings with trees that are probably 30 or 40 or 50 years old by the time we're seeing them in the rendering. And, but they didn't start there. That's the finished product. So it, it's, it's almost like you've got to reduce and take apart these plans and get back to the fundamentals and how are they connected to the neighborhoods? How are they uh, creating these, these spaces? How are they relating to other buildings within the neighborhood? And what, how are they responding? What's that dialogue? And, and we always seem to be focused on that project, but we need to take a step back and look at the relationship and work our way back to that. Yeah, comment and then a question, which is uh, an excellent uh, uh, overview, I think, of urban design, very, very helpful. I'm glad we have it uh, recorded for others to see. But it does, the, the follow-up to this conversation that we're having right now, the overall presentation, it strikes me that uh, a lot of what we're talking about in these urban design principles, and you mentioned it in your presentation, the layout of, um, of Charleston, I think it was, right, where it goes back no, Savannah, thank you. It goes, you know, it starts at the very beginning. Well, we can't roll back the clock where we are, and a lot of what we're doing is retrofitting to what was, you know, a, the rapid development of Arlington post World War II, without that kind of forth, forethought necessarily. So we're trying to squeeze some of these elements in, and and a lot of the discussion what we're talking about here it really takes place now when we're looking at sector plans, small area plans, maybe PDSPs not so much at the SPRC level. So the question is, what should we be looking at 
other than compliance, when we, you know, all of this obviously makes a lot of sense when we were looking at courthouse, when we were talking about Roslyn, and we were talking about trying to create an 18th Street corridor, et cetera, those kinds of things. But when individual SPRCs come in, what is their responsibility and their in a, in an individual building or project's role in the overall fabric? What should we be looking for? And the follow-up to that is um, the role of, uh, of architectural quality, and quality being defined in the sense of the, the, the durability and the lasting value of a building. Should we expect, does the community, does the public have a public interest in that we are now building buildings that will last a long, long time? Or is it okay to assume this building has a, a, a 30, you know, 30 or 40 year pro forma and if that's all that we're going to get out of it, then so be it. Um, well, in terms of the, the question about buildings, I mean, we certainly should be looking at, at buildings as being something that um, we don't tear down all the time and constantly replace. So um, I think the, the more flexible buildings can be, the higher quality they can be, the better. Um, I know whenever like we site plans come through, um, one thing I'm always looking at is the, the, the types of materials that they're using and the durability of those materials. Um, I think in particular on the lower stories where they're kind of adjacent to pedestrians and people can um, actually interact with them. Um, in terms of your question about the SPRC and uh, what everybody should be looking for, um, I mean, I think in the absence of a plan, like so if it, you know, looking at a, a site plan that's maybe in an area where there is no plan or it's, um, you know, uh, there maybe is, is a lot of guidance. Um, and I think the important things to look for is, you know, are the, is the building helping to define the street space? Um, what are the quality of the materials that are being used? Um, is the building being a good neighbor um, to the adjacent buildings around it? Um, and first and, first and foremost, I also think the, the whatever is happening on the ground floor is particularly important. Um, you know, are there lots of doors and windows? Are the service and loading, are those happening in, in a place that's not going to interfere with the pedestrian experience? Um, I'm not saying that the upper part of the building isn't as important, um, but really, it, you know, the, I think the, the, the place where the most attention should be given is on those lower stories where they're closest to the street, closest to pedestrians. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the top is important as well, but. Those, those lower levels are, are what to look for the most. Hi, uh, this one's from Brad. Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, nitty gritty in thinking about the park planning process. When we're dealing with, uh, I think, uh, privately owned spaces. Think, of, for example, Penn Place, what you had there, and I'm just trying to um, figure out or, or the, the allocation of work, the responsibilities we have. On planning process that we went through at Penn Place a couple of years ago. And as you show, this, this beautifully thought out design, and there was all this public input. So there's there's a park plan there, and I guess that lays out locations of things and where basic the walkways would be and the functions would be. But then we know when we get down the road, when they actually start to build that thing, they're going to come back to us. And then I assume there'll be a park design process, right, where you get into the degree. I'm trying to think, where does one stop in the way we think of things here at Arnold? Where does one stop and where, is, where, where, where do we have the plan? It's the plan, and, you know, what I call function, locations of things. And where does, where does design pick up? And, and uh, I'm trying to sort that out. And specifically, we, we've got a project we just dealt with uh, the other night where we started to talk about the uh, Wilson Boulevard at Penzance site. And a couple of started having questions. There was this public plan. We're getting the specifics of the design that's being proposed. So I'm just trying to figure that one out. Yeah, I think in terms of design, it never stops. Um, the thing about landscapes is they're constantly evolving. Um, they're living, um, growing, they get outdated. And so, um, you know, while the Pin Place design is a great plan, it's a concept. Um, and as you mentioned, they'll come in and get a finer grain of detail and start looking at it, evaluating that concept against reality, um, you know, infrastructure, and there's a lot of things that we'll continue to look at as, as staff as well as with you all. Um, but, you know, all the way through through 100% construction documents and even, you know, after it's built, um, uh, you know, looking at post-occupancy, so 
works and what it doesn't work. It's all about, it's an ever-changing landscape, and so um, it's not set in stone um, forever. Um, and so, you know, we're always going to be looking at in great detail throughout the life of the project. Next question or comment? I just wanted to thank you, uh, Brad and Justin, for doing such a good job of outlining all the tools that exist for urban design and all the sort of constituent elements. And um, one of the things that has always perplexed me about the SPRC process is this um, need for site analysis. So you, you really just gave us all the component elements of site analysis. And so I'm wondering, maybe this is a question to the folks who participate in SPRCs and who lead them, but at what point in the process should the site analysis take place? And who should be involved? Is this something you require of the applicant? Is this something that happens at maybe the first SPRC? Is it something staff prepares, citizens work on? Uh, you know, we've just given, we've been given the outline. So, so when should this happen and how should it happen? Steve, you want to take that one? Well, we, uh, I, I kind of like to touch on Eric's question first, you know, and then is, and we have, we have a series of plans throughout the county that the, the, the county's adopted. We'll just take the Roswell plan, for example. That was, um, that was a plan that generated a whole series. I mean, you looked at an entire area and how each block connected and how great spaces you Using the, eight, the, the 18th Street concept really unites, you know, unites those properties and creates a really interesting space. And so, like Brett said, you're, you, you are trying to, it, the plan is a concept, it's a guide for, for all future development. You know, and I think the Rosalind plan really does a good job of that. As each project comes in, you can actually see, okay, how does this relate to the plan? Does, does it follow the Basic guides and spirit of the plan is great, interesting open spaces. Does it, does it, does it help facilitate the 18th, 18th Street component of that? So um, I think that's really the role, the role of the plans. Um, as far as we, when we get into site analysis, um, we we have a process of projects right now, and I'll kind of kind of quickly walk through it. We have a concept plan review process, which is something that we look at. Kind of like a first blush before anything's even submitted to make sure that what's being proposed is, is basically consistent with our plans. We really don't get into the details, but we offer some general guidance and guidance for an applicant if they wish to pursue it further. Okay, then, then ultimately they do submit a, a project to us, and, uh, and that's when we start getting into the more detailed evaluation you know, of every aspect of the project. So you know, I think they, I think they pretty much covered it in their PowerPoint presentation about the different site components that are evaluated for the whole project. If, if, if I could also take a stab at it from the SPRC viewpoint, I think of a planning commission, and planning commissioners are the ones who chair individual site plan reviews. We tend to have a first meeting that is sort of an overview of the entire project so that people get familiar with the building, with the street improvements that might be proposed or expected to be fulfilled with that particular plan, as well as some of the open space. And it's in that context that I think we, the next part of it is to do a site analysis to really start to think about what are the access point, what is the building framing the street, is there the green space, and then after that, start really getting into the details about the transportation, the elements of the green space, and the rest of it. And to that end, we have been advocating and we try to do a site visit, because after you, in general, try to do one SPRC that's the overview to get everybody's mind sort of, okay, this is what it is, this is what's being proposed at this point, and then to actually go out and look at the site and think about the proposal in the actual built environment that exists. And perhaps even think about the next built environment, because sometimes, as Eric said, all of this is infill in many ways. We, we don't have large tracts all the time like we did at Penn. So it's to think about the proposal in its current context and then 
what might come next and physically be next to it. I will admit we're going to be a little bit challenged with the winter because we have a site plan coming up just nearby for the Methodist Church here in Boston and to find we thought we'd do it Saturday, but you know now the Mother Nature is intervening. But I think that that gets to some of the, the site analysis part of it. Well, you know, I, uh, I'd like to kind of go back to the beginning where you discussed the organic nature of neighborhoods and how neighborhoods have uh, sort of natural boundaries and elements that, that uh, unite that neighborhood. And my neighborhood has none of that. And I have decried this for decades now that I've lived here, but our neighborhood, Columbia Heights, was artificially created. The boundaries were artificially created. It, it almost feels to me like an African nation where two uh, warring tribes were combined by, uh, you know, uh, you know, some European country that moved in and said, "Okay, this is going to be Zaire or, or something like that." And and in my neighborhood, there is no cross street between the east side and the west side. There's there's no physical connection between one side of the neighborhood and the other. One side of the neighborhood is, is uh, you know, uh, townhouses or, or uh, you know, those uh, 40s style uh, garden apartments. And the other side are huge high rises. So there's nothing that connects my neighborhood. And, you know, the only thing that would solve the problem in that sense is what Paris did. And I saw a program about the development of Paris and basically, the, throughout history, people who ran Paris basically uh, had grand plans and they destroyed neighborhoods in order to create beautiful, beautiful urban plans, right? But they had to destroy slums and they did drastic things that we would never do. So, I mean, I'm just pointing this out that there are still, there are parts of Arlington that are so disconnected. Um, and and I, the south side of, of and Columbia Pike is a classic example, but our neighborhood is one of those neighborhoods that is not really a neighborhood. And I don't know how to solve it, but we need a through street. And that requires city planning, and it requires more of a grand vision um, to, to create something uni unified. And I, I don't know how that goes with the process. Um, I really appreciate the question that was raised about um, site analysis, and I think that that is um, a fundamental issue that we do face in the site plan review process and in implementing our plans. So, um, just to be totally honest about it, that the and I'm an architect, so I, I work for private uh, companies. Um, when you are coming in with a development proposal, you interest us on the applicant side is to get it approved. So you will pick and choose the elements that uh, you believe will um, lead to approval. That's not necessarily always in alignment with the public uh, interest or the, the elements that are of importance to the public. So I think it's difficult for the applicant to for us to have applicants as honest brokers of site analysis, um, it's just not it, it, it's it's just not a part of, uh, of the normal process. So so then the burden really, in a lot of ways, falls on the staff, um, I believe, because the citizens are lay people and, and uh, it's it's an ever rotating group of citizens, whereas staff have the continuity. So I think your presentation about fundamentals goes to the heart of what are the fundamentals that on the public side we will always analyze and evaluate for each project as they come forward and I, and I think that you know there are we've touched on some here and I think there are actually probably some more that merit discussion as we look at what constitute analysis and I think this is the one of the fundamental problems so when the project is to site plan and just to be totally frank, 
an applicant invests a lot of money into bringing projects in with wind rates, and it's a, it's a very difficult process and difficult for the applicants and the architects. It's hard for staff to say to them, you guys didn't even pay attention to this fundamental issue after they've spent about a half a million dollars on preparing an application. So the more that we're able to inculcate these principles and fundamentals early on, that these are the foundation of how we evaluate projects, that every single applicant is going to have to look at the shadow impacts on a neighborhood. They're going to have to look at the wind impacts on a neighborhood. They're going to have to look at how the building frames open space. That we know every single time you're going to have to come in and you're going to have to address the fundamentals of urban planning. The site plan process will be improved and we won't get into these conflicts so much with the applicants. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We talked about sort of unpacking the, the design and the plan. And, and so really the question becomes how do we do that? And, you know, you, you start to see how we look at them and unpack a design and, and we go back to sort of our mental checklist. Let's talk about the scale. Let's talk about views. And, and I think ideally, that's the conversation we also have with the community. We, we do a wonderful job having that conversation when we're doing a sector plan or you know the, the, these other types of public events because we start, we very methodically go through the steps of gathering you know, what's the history of the site, what's the materials, and, and who are the people that made the site what it is. And I think, you know, talking to, to Steve, what do you see as the future of how do we engage the public, but you know, how, do you, how do we get to this process where we are not looking at the finished product and almost being forced to react to it, but actually being part of the building of that relationship and almost using some of these terms as a checklist to say, yes, great scale, no, or relationship to a historic building. How, how do you see the future of our relationship as we go through these planning and development projects? Well, I think, I think uh, I'd like to address one thing Brian said, and that is um, when projects come in and absolutely have a lot of problems, uh, whether it relates to what the government plan says or uh, just doesn't fit scale-wise or anything like that, we do say that. We have, we have turned some projects away just because they're so off base and so, so outrageous, so to speak. You know, but, but at the same time, we do provide them guidance and say, look, if you do this, you do this, you do this, okay, and then you might have something here that you need to, need to, to redo this. Um, and and that, that really is what we're doing now in our concept plan review process. Bef before any applicant spends a lot of money Drawings and things like that, we sit down with them, we go through the basics, and they look like they have a project. Then we say, all right, you, you've got something here, and it's worth, worth submitting. Um, I, I think you know, we're, we're working with the Planning Commission a lot um, on um, the, the process and how, how projects and, and go through the various stages. Um, we, we, you know, the SPRC process, I think, really is an important stage. And Public has an opportunity to really sit down and address the, the various design components. We certainly want to, want to continue that. Uh, I, I will say this: um, uh, I, I don't think we have to take as long in that process to come to the to the same conclusion. Um, so uh, I think we can be a little bit more efficient there. Um, I think another thing that's important in the process is. After it gets through the SPRC process, it then still has to go through, through the Planning Commission and maybe some other commissions for evaluation. And so there are plenty of opportunities for the public, if they have a particular interest in something like that, there are plenty of opportunities for citizens to provide that input as we're going through the Planning Commission and other, uh, other commissions, so to speak. Uh, that obviously gets to, to the um, county board. This is pretty good you know, overall. Um, I, I, I do think that um, for our plans, I think our, 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 our 
process is superb. Um, for individual projects, I think there's some improvements that we can work on. Um, I, I also would like to touch on there, there are opportunities out there that, that I think we don't necessarily recognize that would provide some big impacts even in the future of the county. This has been off a little here, but I know when I first got here, you, you asked me, okay, you've been here a month or two here in Arlington. What have you noticed so far? And um, there were a couple of things I picked up right away, and that is um, here, Arlington is on the it's on the Potomac River, and there's very little access to the river at all. And here you have a spectacular opportunity to provide access to the river, and we essentially turn it backwards. So I think Boston and Gateway Park is an incredible opportunity for us to do that. And so one of the one of the projects that we've had some preliminary conversations on is actually the Marriott Hotel site. Right at the bridge, where they're um, probably in the next six months or so, they will be looking to submit something to redevelop that site. So here's an opportunity for not only to look at that site, but for the community to look at, okay, how can that better tie in to Roslyn? How can that better tie in to Gateway Park? How can that provide access to the river that we just don't have? You know, so here's an opportunity to not only address that project, but look at other options provide the kinds of things that we're looking for in a much bigger picture. I could say the same thing too about um, you know is, is is there is there a space in Arlington where all our every resident in Arlington can go to for major events, major um, you know whether it's an it's a, an outdoor a major outdoor concert, festival, whatever. We really don't have that. I know we've talked about this a lot. But the Courthouse Square actually, the, the Courthouse Square plan is that opportunity. And so uh, when when a development comes in, in or around the Courthouse Square, that's our opportunity to not only look at that project individually, but say, how can that help us implement what we're recommending the Courthouse Square plan? If we implement, if we implement court, Courthouse Square, it is going to have such a huge impact on Arlington and this community. Way beyond, I think, you know, our, our wildest dreams. You, you look at, uh, uh, although this is a much larger scale, Millennial Park in Chicago, okay, it's basically a, like a rail yard. They decided to put it, uh, invest in Millennial Park. And what happened was not only is, this, is it a spectacular place to go, but the, the economic development opportunities that it created just created all this additional value for the land, these spectacular buildings and projects. All of a sudden, you turn an area that pretty much you no know, activity at all into one of the greatest places in the country to go. You know, on a smaller scale, we could do that in Courthouse Square. Um, Steve, thank, thank you. Anyway, not, not me, right? thank, thank you very much yeah. for, yeah. For, for your insights, particularly as, as head of CPHD. And I just wanted to say, on behalf of SPRC, we appreciate that. You know, the notion that sometimes we think the SPRC process, which does focus a lot on the design elements that we saw this evening, can be a little long. I, I'd like to be very clear that in some ways, that is because we have applicants who come in with a particular plan in mind and very much have their vision for a particular site. And in site plan review, we have to be very clear what is the adopted county plans for that site, which may not necessarily be in complete alignment with what is being proposed to us. And, for, and so through the SPRC process, we, we hope to actually bring the two much more together, particularly knowing that staff has done this initial analysis now with the concept review and really set the ball to say to them, this is what the community expectation is. And so, you know, just to be, to be clear, there's lots of players at the table and everybody needs to be working together. And there are moments where that isn't always the case. And it's not always the developers. It can be the neighborhood. It can be others. And so coming out of the SPRC process,
process, you may have a consensus, but you won't have unanimity. Or we may have really been successful in just leaving two or three elements that then go and can be hashed out more at other commissions and the planning commission. But just to be clear, by the time a project gets to planning commission or the other commission reviews, if they're done towards the end, there has been a lot of money spent by the applicant. So the more that we can do up front, staff, as well as citizens at SPRC, and maybe that's making a slightly different process. Maybe that's having an SPRC meeting that comes very early, perhaps even after the conceptual plan, and being very clear from the citizen side of, of what the expectations are, and then having the developer go back and then come again. I'm not sure about that. But, but what I do know is that our collaborative process really needs to take into account the money that's spent by our applicants because that ultimately helps us, but it also needs to be clear where the community stands on things. And, and I think that's part of what we do. Thanks, we have a um, Kind of going off of that, I think the thing that struck me about the presentation was a lot of the public open space is about creating a sense of community and a sense of place. And yes, it's about great design, but more importantly, it's about how do you encourage neighbors to come out of high rises and, and be social. And I think with Arlington, it's such a transient neighborhood. There's so many people moving in and out of the county that we really do need to do a better job of, of really thinking about how we are creating our public space in order to give somebody that sense of home. And, you know, I agree with you. I think we do have, we have great committees and commissions that are here. But there is a, a definite barrier to get involved with the planning process or even just, you know, projects that you love and you want to support. It's a little tough when maybe that's 10, 20 years down the road and you're not going to be in Arlington in two years. So I would really say that I would love to see the county go in the direction of piloting things more often and, and testing concepts and not spending a lot of money, you know, being lighter, bigger, cheaper. And this is really something we're seeing cities the U.S. do, um, but I think there's a tendency here to make sure we go through all these approval processes and, and we really kind of miss that key step of getting community buy-in and testing things and, and making sure that, um, you know, we're not afraid to fail and we can make tweaks and I, I really commend you for doing the pop-up plaza and, and the pop-up park um, and I, I think things like parklets test out and see how it goes and if it doesn't work then we learn from it but at least you have the opportunity to get people engaged um, in a way that I think we're kind of missing right now in Arlington so yes hi I, I want to very much support what Nancy said uh, because yes I mean having been involved in many SP I wouldn't say that anyone's anxious to spend many more months working on things than it did many, many months. But uh, sometimes it takes uh, quite a bit to get things in line. And the truth of the matter is, once it goes through the commission approval process, it's a very different outlook on how much has been decided on the plan. And yes, I've seen changes made many times I have when things were obvious. But I also wanted to ask you something. We're talking about the general a great deal here and the overview and the overall network that's being set up, especially in complex SPRCs or PDSPs. About some of the specifics. I've noticed over quite a bit of time in SPRCs, things have been getting better in terms of getting building materials, facades, but still I think people are very much Surprise, or sometimes it's very difficult even with very major projects to have an idea of the final building. And it can even vary greatly within uh, illustrations in a particular SPRC. You know, uh, people fix it, things come along. But uh, how do you consider that? And over the years, I've heard many times questions about getting more representative illustrations, better ideas of the final thing. 
And with parks, I just wanted to say that one of the, the uh, commissioners was saying, I think sometimes I, I understand that that works, and sometimes I would appreciate even more of the texture specifics. You know, you can have a small, very simple network with such exquisite results. Maybe here's what this work for experimentation. But how do you get into the specifics? We're very fortunate that we have something like urban forestry who has always reminded me of small bodies, plantings, and things. But I'm wondering how you consider the specifics of the process. We have a gentleman back here that want to make a comment or question. And I think one thing that we all have to understand is, is that the developers are putting their projects together. Uh, you know, they, they go through, it's, it's a, a, a performer, right? So they're really looking at the financial considerations. And a lot of the conversations with staff are about density and square footage. It's not about scale and relationship to other buildings. And I, and I wonder sometimes, and perhaps as part of the application process, we would ask them to respond to these fundamental elements of design as part of their application as a way to introduce the project rather than just sort of dumping these big numbers and these, these, these things that are motivated by their financial decisions. Because that's, we don't have any part in that. That's, that's the market, and, that, and, that's, and that's not really for us to say that, that financial piece of it. But I do think there is a role for them to explain how they, uh, they want to address these fundamental design issues. And perhaps that's something that could be more a part of that, that process and get into those details so that we understand what was that architect thinking in his office in New York when he was designing this public space in Arlington. And, and please explain your methodology and how you arrived at that because you can see these guys really know how to do that and most good designers do. And I think that connection with the public is something that we can continue to have and, and build upon. I think, I think you might have just asked my question my comment was I don't I don't know very much about uh, urban design at all, so the fundamentals approach tonight has been very uh, educational for me. I appreciate that. Thanks. I think my question was sort of a follow-on to that, and I'm just trying to understand it at the uh, review process because what a commercial developer is to when you use the pen place example. Uh, I, I liked all the, the slides as you showed, but I could see that there must be a big difference just in Outdoor space and the economics of some of them have water features and boulders and some of them some just have a bench and a tree. Um, what would be the incentive for the commercial developer to have a better, i.e., more expensive, more attractive to the public uh, open space plan as opposed to a less expensive? Standards. If we want to be a world class city and have world class public spaces, we have to 